uh, the government would say, but we'll pay you a billion. We just want you to do it our way. No, but that's the wrong way. Kimball Musk was recently interviewed by Graham Bensinger, and he's talking about the early days of SpaceX in the interview, which taught me a lot of things about SpaceX, and I figured I would share them with you. Now, we know that SpaceX has a very different style than the government, than NASA does, and that's part of why they're so successful and revolutionary in the space industry. But what SpaceX has become was not the original intention or idea behind SpaceX. In fact, Kimball reveals in an early discussion about SpaceX, the idea originated in a conference room where it was proposed as a philanthropic venture, aiming to transport a plant to Mars in a small ceramic jar as proof of concept rather than establishing a business. To, to take a potted plant, just like in, in a little ceramic jar with, with leaves on it, and get it to Mars. Just to prove that it can be done, not, not, not like build a business or anything like that. And, uh, and then that turned into, well, maybe the best way to do this is as a for-profit. And Now, of course, this concept evolved into a for-profit model, the SpaceX that we know and love today. Now, this was motivated by a desire to support the venture while enjoying the spectacle of rocket launches. And I remember thinking to myself, well, I'm going to invest because I love to support my brother, but also it's kind of cool to go watch rockets launch and blow up and stuff. And so that all kind of worked out pretty well. Graham and Kimball then begin to discuss the cost plus contracts that are so detrimental to any progress being made and how SpaceX didn't want to do things the way things have always been done and how that was kind of met with resistance at first. And so SpaceX came along and said, look, we're doing the math on this. This thing's not going to cost that much. It's not going to cost a billion dollars. It's going to cost $50 million. And uh, the government would say, but we'll pay you a billion. We just want you to do it our way. No, but that's the wrong way. You have to, you should do it this way. It's 50 million. We were very happy with that price. The government was like, no, but we don't want that. We know that traditional cost plus contracts are inefficient and they're used by the military industrial complex where companies are incentivized to inflate costs for higher profits. SpaceX challenged this model by offering fixed cost services, significantly reducing space launch costs. But government and military officials accustomed to the cost plus model had initial disbelief in SpaceX. And we actually couldn't believe it. We're like, but you must want it for a lower price. Actually, they didn't care that much about price. The, the, especially the generals. The generals and the, the military, they really didn't care about price because they really needed it. They I had one conversation with the general. It was very enlightening. He was like, I need you to understand, I am a general. I am in charge of success in war. I need it to be the way I need it to be. You need to understand where I'm coming from. I need to control this. SpaceX didn't want to do things just the expensive, inefficient way. Their new approach gained traction, leading to their dominance in the launch market and the establishment of a more efficient, transparent pricing model akin to commercial services like Amazon. And finally, this portion of the interview wraps with Kimball reflecting on the fourth flight of Falcon 1. This was the make or break flight for SpaceX and he actually almost missed it. What, what actually turned out is we got there maybe a few minutes before the launch. So we almost missed it. But it was kind of the right, it was just, we were just kind of in the flow. We get there and the launch goes off successfully. And it, it wasn't like a celebration, it just, everyone just started crying. It was just this emotional release of years of working and um, people hugging each other. Uh, it, was, it wasn't like a celebration experience. It was like a, an emotional uh, uh, release. SpaceX's fourth launch attempt was on September 28th, 2008, after three previous failures. With the company on the brink of bankruptcy, the successful launch from a modest control room in LA was watched shortly after a day at Disneyland, and this represented a pivotal moment of emotional release and triumph over adversity for Kimball, for Elon, for the whole SpaceX team. This also showcased the potential of startups to achieve unprecedented feats in space exploration, ultimately securing a significant NASA contract. And also this week, we are celebrating the sixth anniversary of the first Falcon Heavy launch that was back on February 6, 2018. So it's just amazing to 
look back and reflect, I had the pleasure of talking to Kimball briefly during the inaugural Starship launch that was on April 20th last year. So I would love to talk to Kimball more in depth about this, but I'm very grateful that Graham was able to interview him and provide us with this interview. I mean, you've, you've been with the SpaceX journey from the beginning. Like, yeah. How proud are you of Elon and the uh, team? Elon is just uh, so proud of him and, uh, and of course the SpaceX team. And you know what, what happened today is exactly what we were, our goal was as a test. Let's get it up as far as we can. Let's learn as much as we can. And um, on the next one, we'll, we'll take it one step further. I feel like it went really well. It went really well. It was so exciting to watch that lift off. Was uh, one, of the, one of the greatest experiences of uh, my journey with SpaceX. Absolutely. Because when you really reflect on what SpaceX has done for the industry, how it began, and how vital it is today. I'm just so glad that they made it, they survived, they succeeded, and they have changed things forever. What we had done had never been done before. Uh, launched a private, a private company launched into, into, into orbit, and it was the last shot we had before we'd be out of business. Honestly, cost plus pricing really is a disaster and has plagued the industry for quite some time now. So this next topic really grabbed a lot of your attention. Essentially, SpaceX and the government still work together, of course, and we're glad SpaceX didn't give in to the government's overspending in the early days. But now the Pentagon is approaching SpaceX about controlling specific Starship missions, which has hundreds of you commenting your concern on X. I interviewed a DOD expert about this, and here is a clip. Basically, this is the post. You know, it got uh, over 260,000 impressions and the U.S. Department of Defense is engaging with SpaceX to explore the possibility of the government taking control of Starship for sensitive and potential, potentially dangerous missions. This was first reported by Aviation Weekly, and there's been a lot of discussion about this on X as well as concern. And so what we're hearing sounds very much like uh, the Space Force is trying to create a civilian reserve uh, space fleet or Starfleet, if you want to be uh, facetious. Um, Essentially, <laughs> we're looking at the Department of Defense trying to uh, uh, put together some sort of subsidy program so some number of the starships are available for moving defense payloads. Essentially, what the Pentagon is doing since currently the two variants of starship that are available either drop Starlink satellites or are built to go to the moon, they're probably... Uh, negotiating with SpaceX to develop a version of Starship that is geared to moving something the size of this Hubble Space Telescope to low Earth orbit, or to move something like a, a, an old Rhyolite uh, signals intelligence satellite into low Earth orbit with a really big kick stage to go up to geosynchronous. These would be uh, from the National Security Agency or the National Reconnaissance Office. And having that capability available on call in emergency in case someone uses an anti-satellite weapon to knock out one of our uh, high profile and very few uh, spice machines would be something that due diligence wise, the Department of Defense would do. It is their job. Right. So I think part of the the article and the post that I made that concerned people in the proposed agreement, the Pentagon would fly Starship as a government controlled vehicle. So are we reading that correctly? Is that a bad thing? Well, civilian reserve air fleet, when the government punched it, and it's done it three times in the history of the program, took over a lot of civilian uh, airliners. They were under military control. The crews were the airline crews. Uh, the maintenance people were still the same maintenance people, but they were flying chartered missions for the U.S. military. So, yes, that is under U.S. government control. Now, are we talking the U.S. government buying those airlines? No. The U.S. government has a long history of taking over airlines in the event of war. We did that first in the Second World War. Uh, Pan Am was flying flying boats for the United States Navy in the Pacific, for example. The Civilian Reserve Air Fleet program was an extension of that World War II experience. And we the last time it was used was for the uh, evacuations of Af from Afghanistan. So control is a uh, 
word that has lots of me different meanings. In this case, control may mean simply a lease. Um, right. If we're talking Starship, you know, if the U.S. government pays SpaceX enough money to build three Starships that are capable of uh, moving something the size of a Hubble Space Telescope and say, we want you to build those and have them in a warehouse sitting there for us to use at any given time. Well, that is within the budget of the Space Force. Uh, the question is, uh, bottom line, who owns it? And with craft, the federal government does not have to own the machine or the spacecraft or the airliner. It simply pays a subsidy to a firm to have it available at need. Right. So right. it sounds to me that, that we're looking for a civilian reserve space fleet rather than a the U.S. government is reaching into SpaceX and controlling it. Now that video will be coming soon, so stay tuned. And as always, government contracts are good and keep SpaceX alive, but a fine line needs to be walked to avoid corruption and wasteful habits. Thanks for watching this video. I hope that you enjoyed it. If you want more SpaceX related news, please subscribe to my channel, Ellie in Space.